All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us here today. My name is Aaron from Promark and D'Addario. And here today with a very special guest, longtime Evans and signature Promark artist, Rick Latham. How you doing, Rick? Hey, Aaron. I'm good, man. How you doing? Very well. Thanks for thanks for making some time for us. Um, hey, thanks for having me, man. So if you're not familiar, you know, Rick is a very highly accomplished clinician and educator, as well as a studio and touring drummer. Um, he's worked with a wide range of artists, including B.B. King, Edgar Winter, Quincy Jones, Chuck Rainey. Um, he also fronts his own bands and projects. Uh, but our focus for today is celebrating the 40th anniversary of Rick's legendary book, Advanced Punk Studies, which you amazingly wrote at the, at the age of just 25 years old. Um, before we get too deep into the book, I'm going to just turn it over to you, Rick. Let's, uh, you know, we're very excited that Rick has his whole setup here um, to play for you guys. So why don't we just kick it off with a little drumming? All right. All right. I would like to say thanks again to Promark and uh, Evans, the Dario company, for having me. Thank you, Aaron, and all the guys behind the scenes. Um, Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And if you're coming in a little late, I'm, I'm going to be switching around a little bit to some different shots. So I've got some different shots here uh, in my setup. So I'll be switching around a little bit when I'm playing so you can see kind of what's happening. So I'll uh, try to answer some questions. I'm going to kind of go through the book briefly uh, just to give you a little bit of history about the book and the way it's set up and um, why I think it's been... Uh, you know, in the mainstream for 40 years. It's incredible to really think about it. But um, so we'll get into some different stuff. I'm going to play just for a minute, just use some of the things from the book. Awesome. Let's hear it. Sounds up. great as always. Uh, thank you, man. Thank you. Just a little bit, just a little playing, you know. But we'll get into some more grooves as we go through the book. Yeah, so why don't we just talk a little bit about the origins of the book and, and what inspired you, again, at such a young age, to to create this this book? You know, what, what led you to write it in the first place? Well, um, you know, I was going to North Texas. I was actually working on my master's uh, degree. Uh, I had a teaching assistantship at uh, North Texas, North Texas State, University of North Texas now, but at that time it was called North Texas State. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was a time, man, I think the late 70s, uh, mid to late 70s, there was a big change in music where this uh, kind of music changed a little bit and it was uh, getting a little more, there was a, a, lot, a lot more kind of jazz elements and not, not I don't want to say fusion, but, you know, kind of funky elements coming into pop music and a lot of great music recorded at that time and um, you know we started listening we were all listening to different guys at, at North Texas uh, of course Steve Gadd, Vinny, David Garibaldi, Mike Clark as well as you know Roy Haynes and all the Elvin all the great jazz guys but that time in the 70s uh, late 70s man everything was changing a little bit and there was uh, just new style of drumming more linear kind of things coming in to, to Vogue, you know, being popular. Mm -hmm. And um, we were all trying to, you know, cop and, and, you know, learn some of these grooves and stuff, just working on them, transcribing. 
And um, I was taking, you know, drum set lessons. I was also studying timpani and teaching snare drum and marimba as part of my teaching assistantship. But, um, you know, I was really drawn to this stuff. I was a big, um, like, rudimental drummer, grew up. Uh, and I really identified, especially with Gad, with his approach to, you know, sticking things around a drum set, more kind of military rudimental vibe. And uh -huh. um, I really, I really got into that, man. And I, and I started kind of transcribing a lot of his stuff as well as some of the other uh, guys that we were listening to. And I would always, in my lesson with Jim Hall, I was studying drum set with Jim Hall at the time. Jim was a, a great one o'clock drummer at one time. He had come back and started teaching at the school. Um, and every, every time I'd walk into a lesson, you know, I'd say, hey, Jim, check this out, man. I, I transcribed this thing, man. Check this out. Some kind of some kind of weird linear thing or something, and I, I kept really I really got into it, and uh, you know all the guys at school we were all practicing different stuff, and they would hear me in the practice rooms and stuff, and and all the all the teachers really encouraged me, said, man, you should write a book with this stuff, you know, nobody has this stuff, you know, really concisely put in book form at that time. It was uh, that was seventy. Seven to seventy nine. I went to North Texas two years for my master's, and um, man, in nineteen eighty, I, I, you know, I took their advice and just, uh, you know, trying to put together. It took me about a year to put everything together. I was just going to ask how long it, yeah, that, that whole process took. Yeah, it took about a year really to organize things. And I wanted, to, I had some great teachers growing up, and also East Carolina University. Harold Jones was my mentor and my first real teacher, percussion teacher. And, um, you know, I really owe everything to Harold, really a, a great mentor, a great influence, just a super musical guy. And we still keep in touch. Um, but I wanted to organize it, you know, because I, a lot of books, there's a lot of great books out, but I feel some are not organized in the most logical way. So I wanted to set it up where you could, you know, play some exercises that were useful, kind of showing that, that uh, style of what was happening. Yeah. And then and then utilize it. You know, that's why the book is set up in exercises and then, you know, a lot of different kind of exercises, hi hat placement and things like that, all about alignment. And there's a lot of doubles use in the book too. a lot of uh, using utilizing doubles around the drums, which people were starting to do at that time, which is more of a rudimental kind of thing, open doubles to sound real big. Mm -hmm. And um, and then at the end of the book, there's some solos that. Uh, a lot of schools use it still all around the world, man, to, for juries and uh, like exams and things like that. So I wanted you to learn some licks and stuff, but not just learn a lot of licks, but learn how to use them in a music, musical applications. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I have to say, as I've told you, you know, on the side, I mean, I when I was coming up, you know, studying oh, privately, this we use this book, and and I I would say too to anyone that's listening, like, you know, it, the book is called Advanced Funk Studies, but these I feel like these you know, uh, these concepts and techniques that you that you outline so beautifully in the book are really applicable to a whole bunch yeah. of styles, just in terms of developing coordination and, you know, um, hi-hat work and just some of the linear things and, and concepts. I mean, you know, even if you're a rock drummer or, or any other type of drummer, there's still a lot that you can gain from this and really just improving your your skill set, you know? Well, thanks. That, that's what it was all about. Yeah, it's not really... You know, it was called, it's funny, man, the story, Advanced Funk Studies, you know, I came up with the title because it, it was mostly kind of funky, linear kind of stuff. But I came up with the title so it would uh, begin with the letter A and it would mm. show up in searches. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <and stuff>. nice. <laughs> so I had to figure out an A word, you know, so so that was funny. That's one reason. But it was, you know, I'm really into funk and R&B my whole life. Uh, growing up in South Carolina and starting to play at an early age with a lot of R&B guys. Um, so that's one reason why it was called Advanced Funk Studies. And it, it's not really an advanced book. I think it's more of a kind of intermediate book, you know. I think it's good. I mean, I, I hear from people all over the world, man, that use it with beginning students just to get them into that stuff. And we'll, we'll go through it a little bit, and I'll show you. There's some very yeah. simple. There's some very simple things in there. And there's some very complex stuff. So, like, let's let's dive into it. Okay? Absolutely, I was about to say yeah. Okay, so so the first section of the book 
is, uh, you know, there's a couple introductory exercises, but the first section deals with uh, hi-hat placement. And I think it was important, you know, a lot of the grooves back then were really all about syncopation and placement. Like, I I'll play a couple of, like, simple beats here. Like... So with a groove like that, you know, the placement is very important. The 16th notes, the way they fall into place. And, and it starts out in the book very simple with some like hi-hat quarter note patterns, just playing mm -hmm. four on the floor, you know, which uh, is kind of disco-y <laughs> kind of sounding. But, you know, playing it like this, like an exercise, uh, like I'm going to play right now, if people are following along in the book, uh, page 10 exercise number one at the bottom of the page this is a uh, hi-hat eighth notes and basically you're just playing hi-hat eighth notes with a quarter note bass drum pulse Now, that's a very simple pattern, but when you speed it up, it really, it starts sounding a little more usable. So the idea, the idea of playing those patterns and the alignment, you know, there's a lot of different situations where you play the quarter note pulse on the bass drum and quarter notes on the hi-hat, but then the second section you play like upbeats, you know, so you're playing. So, you know, again, that sounds very similar, but there's a lot of different variations, like another exercise uh, that, that was like number one under hi-hat off beats. But the thing is, when you start playing these, and I say this in the front of the book, a lot of people don't get this, but I, uh, you should play these with a samba bass drum pattern as well. That's more complex, but a lot more usable. So you could play like the eighth note exercise again, page 10, the bottom number exercise number one, hi-hat eighth notes with a samba pattern. So now it sounds like a totally different groove. You could do that with the eighth note thing too, with the off beat. So those kind of grooves, you know, you can get a lot of mileage out of just playing like 16th notes even with the uh, samba bass drum. So, you know, there's quite a bit of things you can get from that. A lot of people, I think, when they go through the book by themselves, also there's recordings of me at the time. There were, um, there were not many recordings of books with the, the actual author playing the book. 
you know. So I wanted to, I included at that time cassettes of everything. I'm playing every single thing in the book. And um, you can also buy the DVDs now uh, from Alfred. That the first early DVDs I did for each book, Advanced Funk Studies and Contemporary Drum Set Techniques. Um, actually, the videos you can buy, you can download. Uh, and also with the book uh, from Hudson, digital uh, available from Hudson. Hard copies still from Alfred. But um, with those samba patterns and things like that, you know, you can really create some interesting grooves. And again, a lot of that stuff was happening at that time. I'm going to switch back to this uh, camera. We'll move on now through the book a little bit. Any questions? I'm, I'm not looking at the feed. I'm, I'm depending on you guys. Um, just wondering if we might have a question yet. Or yeah. We're, um, yeah. Again, just reminding viewers, please post your questions. We'll, we'll definitely bring them up with Rick. Um, I think I'm sorry, to be, I'm sorry to interrupt you, man. I'm, I'm sorry to be going so fast, too. I'm just trying to get everything in. I know we have limited uh, time. So. No, it's okay. There's a lot to cover. I mean, again, like there's just so much in this book, you know, and there's so many different levels, as you said, that you can take it. You know, you can play it as a beginner. Don't be discouraged by the title. Um, there's plenty of stuff in there to work up your, your facility. Sure. And then again, if you are already an advanced drummer, there's still, I mean, as you were just demonstrating, there's so many different ways you can take it by changing up the bass drum pattern and obviously with the accents, um, that can just, you know, there's so many variants uh, of, of all the exercise and beats just based on changing things up like that, that, that people can do. Yeah. And when I, when I teach the book, you know, when I, they go through it with me, I, I kind of delve more into each one of those things. I mean, I, I recorded everything in the book, which you can hear how it's supposed to sound. And I think a lot of people don't really uh, listen to that enough because I see people playing things out of the book and it doesn't, they don't have the correct feel, you know. So, you know, uh, something like like the next section deals with hi hat openings. I know you happen to like that section. I love it. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's another thing that a lot of guys have trouble with. A lot of drummers, you know, when you're playing, especially in the studio, you know, playing. Let me switch. I'm switching cameras here. So, um, you know, when you're playing like hi hat openings, uh, this is on page 13. Uh, this is exercise number two, a very simple pattern again, but uh, not easy to execute properly. So the, the hi-hat opening. So the idea is to learn, you know, there's a lot of different variations, like if there's on, on the E of the beat, maybe you have an open on the E after the one or after the two. Now, that sounds easy, but a lot of people, when they play opens, they don't play the close. So the whole idea with this exercise section is to play the close as well. Keep the 16th note going. You know, to really keep that sound, that consistent sound, especially recording, you learn a lot of these things uh, when you listen back, you know, tape don't lie. That's something somebody told me a long time ago. So it's always good to record yourself. So this section just deals with a lot of these hi-hat opening kind of things. Um, here's example 14 on page 14. This is the E of one and the and of two, E of three and of four. So the idea too, let me explain this too, this is very important, to learn the pattern and then use it in a, in a groove like I just did. Don't just play the pattern and say, yeah, I got it, I can do it, but, you know, utilize it when you're playing. So that's kind of the first section of the book, and um, 
Then we go into some combination exercises, a couple of fill patterns that are very interesting, um, using some different things around the drums. Um, sorry, get back to you, Aaron. Any questions at all? I don't want to go too fast. I know this is, uh, Actually, you know, I want to do the master class kind of thing, but I also want to answer questions. If, if Yeah, we've got a technical questions. question here. I'm curious um, about the hi-hat openings. What is your foot technique? It's, it's a little hard to see just from that angle. Do you Are you foot down? I mean, heel down? Are you heel up? Yeah, and I'm, that's a good question, and I'm sorry. I don't have a hi-hat camera, but I can try to explain it uh, mm -hmm. as much as I can. Um, yeah, the I'm playing heel down most of the time when I'm doing tricky openings and stuff. I just ease my foot up ever so slightly on the pedal. But that's another thing too to to really learn how to um, uh, control that open. You know, some people open the hi hat is too much. You know, it's like psh, washes out everything. So like you know. You know, yeah, that overpowers the whole the whole. Yeah, you don't then, need right? to do that. The thing is, when you're especially recording and playing a groove, it needs to be, you know, fit in the groove, consistent and stylistically. You know, and not... You know, to get that bark, you just need a... Uh, so you're just opening it just the, the slightest little very, bit, right? Very, very slightly, yeah, but it depends on the hi-hats and your technique. Sure. Your, yeah, you have to learn how to control them. And also, I push into the open a little bit. I kind of push in. So you're I going did, with the shoulder of the stick a bit more when you hit that, that like, open. Like dead stick it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I am slightly just coming back on my heel a little bit. So gotcha. it's a control. It's a control. And some hi-hats are easier to control than others, you know. So, But you have to learn how to do it. You know, that's one thing about all this stuff. And anything you learn as a drummer, you know, you should be able to play this on any drum set. You know, some guys say, oh, man, this is not my drum set. I can do that better on my... But that's something you learn, too, from playing with different artists and rental kits and backline and playing in the studio. Hey, man, if you can play, you should be able to play anything. Mm -hmm. and control it and control it you know learn how to you know that comes it's all about technique and touch touch of the drum set is is really important you know you can have the same drum set and 10 different guys play everybody's going to sound a little different because of their touch and that's that's one thing that i pride myself on and that's you know that's why people hire me and that's a lot of comments that i've got that i'm clean and and in the pocket have a big a good groove and consistent you know especially in the studio so so this section is all about consistency you know and it, it seems simple but man when you're playing a, a fast tempo and you need to open you know uh, uh, well let's do this you know something It's got to be. It's got to be consistent. Got to be clean. And so, and also just the the closing it in time. I think is is such exactly. a exactly important that's thing. That's the whole like, thing. So right. you don't get that flam effect. Yeah. So you, exactly, man. That's that's exactly right. The whole the whole idea with that is to keep the sixteenth going, and keep them consistent, and let the open do whatever it needs to do. A, that's a tough exercise. <laughs> you could play stick control like that and do the accents with that. We used to do that. Oh, on the hi hats. Yeah, yeah. Play. The, oh, oh, use, oh, play the openings for the for the accents. Yeah, the, the oh, accents. Man. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's tricky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could do a samba with that, or you know, a lot of different things. Um, again, the next section is some some fills. And I again, I started using a lot of doubles here, and I wanted people to really understand that. You know, that's really my uh, kind of foundation is a drum core, like I said, and uh, 
doubles. I use a lot of doubles. You know, there's a lot of double grooves in the book and fills and stuff like this. like playing either like a five stroke roll or a triplet two rights and one left or two lefts and one right so i did some fills again very simple this is uh this is like um well uh like number seven on page 17 if you have the book some triplet two sixteenths So the idea, let me uh, change cameras and do that again. Sorry, guys. Let's, let's do this one. I'm just trying to think of different things to play to show you the double things, but I'll show you some specifics in a second. But that playing those doubles are very important, making sure they really come out very clean on the on the drum uh, drum set, especially the toms. Like a good ro thing that I show a lot is a six stroke roll. You know, I use it very open, like triplets. So to keep those doubles very open, that's another important thing to work on. This was the fill section of the book. Then you get into some patterns, like different variation patterns. And at this time, too, um, I, I see some maybe some questions there. I just wanted to stop, slow down for a second. For a minute. You got anything? Uh, yeah, let's take some questions yeah, here. Yeah, um, some comments or comment. I hope it sounds okay out there. I want everybody to tell me how it sounds because I'm always kind of working on my sound here and I do a lot of teaching online so it's usually it's, pretty good so yeah it sounds great man um so we've got a question here uh I am not quite sure how to pronounce the name but the uh the question is how to play the groove in solo number four solo number four solo number four so uh, let's you... let's can we I'll answer it in a little bit when we go through there and get to solo number four is that okay good? Oh, that cool? Okay. Yeah, we can come uh, back to that one. Yeah. And um, I do sure. also want to mention real quick um, yeah. that, you know, obviously you are a signature Promark artist and, you know, I do want to do, we can chat about gear for a bit too, but just um, for everyone to know, it's up on the screen now that we are offering a, a discount code on your signature sticks. So make sure to check those out. Um, and then we have another question here. Um, 717, that, Rick Latham Groove Stick. 717 Hickory, yeah, which, wood, wood tip only so the question is um your technique for using diddles on the toms so i guess just talking about again doubles and and how to get that you know articulation right. and response from right. your toms as well 
as the rest well, of the kit. Well, part of the secret is my Evans Clear G2s. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a uh, little plug for Evans there. I'm also an Evans artist for many, many years and love the heads. But um, that's kind of part of my sound, too. And I'll, I'll, let me show you that. Uh, I, I talk about doubles a lot, again, in my teaching. And, uh, you know, you have to learn to really pull the sound out of the drum. So there's a pattern I like to use, a very simple pattern, and this is in my blue book, the Contemporary Drum Set Techniques book, which, by the way, sometimes not a big plug for my books, but a lot of times I use the Contemporary Drum Set book before I use the funk book, actually. It's funny. that I wrote that 10 years later in 1990, Contemporary Drum Set Techniques, but it's got a lot of these exercises in it, too, but so does the funk book. So just playing clean, pulling the sound out, you know, of the drum. So playing it around the drum set very slowly, but very cleanly. And the same thing with the, with the bass drum. Maybe we can talk about bass drum in a little bit too, but... Um, you know, just being clean, and a lot of people think that, you know, when you play doubles, it's always a bounce. It's, it's really, you know, it's, it's not always a bounce. I like to call it a controlled double stroke. So I like to really think about pulling out, even on the hi-hat. The hi-hat is a great place to practice because you don't get much rebound or bounce. So... So that actually leads into the next section. The, the groove ideas, the funk patterns, also use a lot of doubles and playing doubles not so fast as like a roll or, or very fast 30-second notes, but just clean doubles, especially with these grooves. Like, uh, like uh, let's see, let's look at, um, well, uh, number, this is uh, page 18, exercise number eight. So the idea So the idea of playing those doubles anywhere, even if they're just 16th notes, not so fast, uh, 30 seconds, important, you know. So the hi-hat, five-stroke roll, very simple pattern. That actually is one of my favorites. I do it a lot and use it a lot. This is number uh, page 19, number 22, slowly.
So that diddle is important everywhere, you know. So really practice it on the toms and... Okay, so I hope that helped a little bit. And kind of to go along with that, um, yeah. I think that, you know, there's a question about your tuning, and I think that that's probably an important component of getting that response to with the doubles. So could you just talk a little bit about your, um, you know, your tips on tuning? And then there's... Yeah, yeah. Um, and thanks for the questions. I want to thank everybody for tuning in again. Um, I'm trying to get through as many things as I can. Uh, in a short period of time, but uh, you know, I'll be here for you. So, yeah, let um, me read this one out for you. So it's from Arca, and it's well, um, okay. The two, let me let me just explain for one second. Sorry to interrupt you, Aaron. You're good. Um, the tuning thing. I I actually tune my drums very low, pretty low pitched and pretty loose, but with my technique, it works. You know, a lot of guys have difficult time playing my drums <laughs> because the, the the heads are really loose, but I have good hand technique, you know, so, and that's part of my sound. I, I, listen, I'm a big guy, you know, I have a big sound. So that's uh, part of my whole thing. Um, but I like that dark kind of sound, you know, I, I don't know how well it translates on the internet, but um okay. Yeah, okay. very deep and low. Very deep and low, but they still... That's why I like the, the clear G2s so much because they have attack. You can still hear that attack, and but you still have to have the technique. So again, when I'm when I'm doing that kind of let me see. Uh, your vocal mic. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you, man. I no worries. Sorted. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, man. That's, bas that's, 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 basically, right. that's basically triplets, right, right, left, and two sixteenths. Again, an exercise from the book. When you start using both hands, of course, <laughs> you got to work on that left too. So everything, you know, again, once you learn the, the pattern, learning how to use it is what's really important. You know, not not only the pattern, but learning it, learning how to use it in a, a musical context. Sorry, man, I know you had another question. I think no, that was great. I mean, it's all really good info, and I, I you know, I think some people might be surprised to hear that you're you're you tune. A little bit lower you know you think sometimes i think with funk um, and especially the way that you play that that they might be tuned a bit tighter um arca had also asked in, this, in the same question about tuning um any tips on improving shuffles yeah yeah uh we'll we'll get to a couple things but um it, it's good man i'm here to answer questions so if somebody has a question not about the book let's go for it it's okay i just trying to get through you know since we wanted to spotlight the book a little bit um, yeah, for sure. Shuffles, shuffles are the same kind of way. Again, uh, I've got a lot more shuffle exercises in the in the blue book, contemporary drum set technique. But there are some shuffle patterns too in the funk book that I think are interesting. Um, let's go. This is an interesting uh, couple of patterns. This is page twenty three, uh, and this is like number seventy one through seventy four. And These maybe. Sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say just for, for those that, you know, for some of the more beginner student, um, students that we may have on here, maybe we can just, you can give like a baseline of just kind of what a shuffle is for, for sure. someone that may not even yeah. know. 
you know, sure. what that feel, you know, sounds like. Sure. To me, to me, a shuffle, I mean, a lot of people call shuffles uh, some different things, shuffles, but to me, a shuffle is based on triplets or, or it could be like a uh, dotted eight sixteenth, like the, you know, hip hop kind of thing. So here's a, a like a, I, what I call a, like a rock shuffle. So that's kind of a, just a basic rock shuffle. Then you've got like a more R&B kind of shuffle based on, and again, that's based on triplets. That's actually a good exercise to line up the bass drum. That's the trouble a lot of people have. A lot of people rush the bass drum in a shuffle, you know? Mm. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to tell exactly what's happening. But it starts stumbling. Yeah, shuffle is based on triplets, basically, in, in the way I think about it. An R and B shuffle, like a triplet kind of thing. So the same idea with the hi-hat opening, you see I'm using that hi-hat opening again, it comes into play with the triplet thing too. But the alignment of the triplet, there's a lot of exercises in the book, the triplet alignment thing is very important. Again, where just that basic pattern of playing triplets, alternating triplets. I'm doing it very deliberate, very slow for the uh, more beginner players out there just to show the uh, alignment. But, you know, when you play faster, it's got to still line up. So the idea... Whether you're playing doubles or singles, it's got to line up. Same thing. Triplets are very important. Triplets, you really have to play triplets like triplets, you know. And the shuffle is all based on triplets. Do 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 da do 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 ba do 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 ba. Even a blues shuffle like a. You know, you have to, you just have to play them. You just have to really play them, man. Play, you know, try to play shuffles as many different styles as you can. Now, um, let me get back to the book. The more hip hop -y kind of thing is more of a, like a dotted note shuffle. Kind of the, the halftime kind of shuffle, the Purdy shuffle thing, Jeff Picaro kind of vibe. So that's, again, with the ghost notes. It's still based on the shuffle triplet pattern with, with the right hand.
You know, a lot of people know this, and you've seen it on many different videos, many different guys talk about it, but just practicing it, having the right feel is the thing to work on. Everybody can play the triplet with the ghost in the middle, but having the right feel takes time to get it down. So that shuffle idea is, is important. Now, this is, these are the halftime shuffle things in the funk book. This is, again, page 23. Um, I'm going to look at, uh, let's say, 72. Let's see if I can remember it. I, I don't memorize all this stuff, and I don't, you know, I wrote this a long time ago, 40 years ago. So, you know, I, I'm not memorizing everything in the book, so I have to read some of this stuff. So page 23, number 72. Slowly. I'm playing it basically triplets, uh, one, uh, two rights and a left. There's a, a lot of different versions of it, like 73, a little bit different pattern. Seventy-four is a little bit more different. So you could these are like halftime kind of grooves. So that's some some shuffle talk. Uh, any any other questions? Anything else? I'm depending on you guys. I can't see the questions, but um, oh, I lost you. Sorry, on mute oh, there. There, um, you <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, that was great, man. I mean, there's so many variations to the shuffle, and it's really neat to just hear you play. You know, different variations. Uh, do you recommend, like, in order to develop that feel, obviously that's the most important thing with those with, with those type of patterns. What are your thoughts on practicing with a metronome? Is that something that you, you know, recommend that your students do? Uh, and how best to approach that? Yeah, but metronomes are great. I mean, you know, I grew up playing with a lot of records. I mean, I played with, a, you know, I would put records on and, you know, play with, uh, you know, play with CDs or whatever, some of your favorite music. And, you know, that's the best thing, I think, is to play with some music. Metronome practice, excuse me, is great. But, uh, you know, to play with something else happening in the music is great, too. Even if yeah. you have a drum machine, program a little groove in there mm -hmm. or something to play along with that, I think, is better. But, of course, practicing with a metronome is very important. But also... Also, learning to listen to your practice. I think a lot of a, a lot of drummers don't really utilize the best principles when they practice. You know, learn to listen to yourself and don't don't play it once and then say, "Yeah, I got it. Sounds good." No, man, <laughs> you got to play it like millions of times, thousands of times, to to have it really a part of your playing. Like this stuff I'm doing. You know, I don't think about the grooves like in the book. They're, they're kind of part of my playing, you know. So I, I don't think about, okay, play this diddle here and this here. I just play it because it's kind of part of my vocabulary now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's important that you learn how to not only play with the metronome, but make it feel good when you play with the metronome. Make it feel like music. And, and try to play with people as much as you can, you know, other musicians. I think that's good. Even if you have a buddy 
that is, plays bass a little bit or guitar or something. Just get together yeah, and play. Playing with other people. Play, yeah, play music, you know. That's good. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and and talk about gear actually in a little more okay. detail. Um, I, I think sure. it'd be you know it'd be great to just give give folks a little rundown of of your sticks and you know what how you develop that. Sure. Um, tell sure. us a little bit about them. And again, just for everyone viewing out there, you know we are offering um, a discount code on the sticks right now. So check check them out. They're really it's a really great feeling stick. Um, and I'm just curious to hear you know. Um, how you landed on these specs. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, I, I like it too, man. I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a big guy and I have big hands, but I use, a, it's about like a 5A diameter. Uh, my stick, again, it's the Rick Latham 717, and it's got a really nice taper and also uh, like a barrel-shaped bead. I don't know if you can, you can see the, the bead here is, uh, you know, like a pretty much barrel shape, which I think sounds really good on the cymbal. So, you know, a 5A always felt good to me. And um, the diameter, it's not so big, but it's a great stick. Some jazz guys like it and some rock guys like it. So it's a good kind of overall stick. It's got a good weight, a really good balance. And I love that tip. It sounds really good on the cymbal, very articulate. So I, I wanted to get the articulation. I like real dark symbols too. So that's uh, I'm, this is the Istanbul Mehmet Hammer series, twenty two. Pretty dark. All my symbols uh, and I use Istanbul Mehmet for many many years. Um, but the stick has a really good sound. I think on all symbols. And it's funny. Even when other drummers play with the stick, they see they feel a difference. So that's that's interesting. I think. And again, it's uh, sixteen inches long. And um, uh, about a 5A diameter, similar to a 5A, but the taper's a little bit different in that barrel-shaped bead. So, you know, we went through a couple different things when I was trying the prototypes and stuff, but uh, came up with this, and it's, it's been a good stick, man. And uh, again, the Rick Latham 717, and there's some kind of special going on right now. Uh, Aaron, maybe you can... Tell them a little more about that. I don't know. What yeah, it's up on the screen at the moment. So okay. definitely recommend checking out the stick. And I mean, you play so many different styles and, and you feel like, are you, do you, you I mean, is that your go-to for everything yeah. or is it yeah. truly? No, that's interesting, man. I, I mean, I have, I have several different brushes and uh, rods. I like the hot rods a lot. The, yeah. the Promark Classic. rods are great. Sure. And, uh, and, you know, you can use those too, man, to play some funky stuff. I mean, they sound great. But yeah, I use this stick all the time. I mean, it, it's the only stick I use, uh, really. It's, uh, you know, it works for everything. And again, you know, it, your technique, it, it depends on your technique, you know. But I think it's a, it's a really good stick. It's a, you know, uh, like I said, jazz guys like it. And uh, it sounds good on the cymbals, which is important. It's got a good yeah. weight. And, uh, you know, I think you should really let the stick, you know, do some of the work. You know, and that this the balance of the stick is really important. So, I'm I'm very happy with the with the stick. I've been you know using the stick for many many years. So, yeah. But um, I, I I think it's you know the combination of the stick and the heads, man. For me, I mean, again, you know, I don't want to jump too fast into Evans, but we're talking about gear. So absolutely, know, yeah. I, I, again, on the snare drum, I'm using a coated Genera with the internal muffle ring. And um, I like a Hazy 300, the, the snare head on the bottom. And uh, I'm using clear G2s on the top of the toms, clear G1s on the bottom. So I like the clear because the clear gives a little, again, it gives a clearer sound. I mean, it's not, it's not a coated head. A coated head is a little darker. And uh, on actually, the bass drum too, man. The bass drum, I use a G2 normally. A clear G2. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 It's kind of an yeah. under underrated head, I think, on the bass drum. Sometimes people yeah. forget that we. Exactly. It makes I, mean, it, you know. I, I love the EMAD and the EQ system. I, I love all those things. 
But um, and I use those sometimes, you know, if I'm like a rental or something, somebody that may not have a 22 inch G2. But um, yeah, I like the G2, and I use the Evans uh, impact pad. I yeah, what you call it, AF patch. Oh, the AF patch. Yeah, there's a couple yeah. different ones. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's great yeah. for so, you know so for the beater you can, attack. You can see. Uh, let's see that if. Uh, if yeah, here you go. So yeah, I'm, I'm using the, the AF patch. patch. The patch. And you can see too, man, my bass drum head is very loose. <laughs> it's very loose, but it works for me. You know, I like, I've got it, you know, got a blanket inside. So I like it, man. Pretty good. Again, the head is very loose, but but I like I, I use a the pretty tight tension on my bass drum pedal, mm. and uh, I like I like the way it feels. Really, like you can dig into it, you know. Yeah, you can see that when you're playing too. I mean, yeah. again, it, it looks so loose, but you get a really punchy, great sound yeah. out of it. Yeah, it's it's crazy, man. And I gotta I gotta give a little props to DW too, because the DW kick drum sounds so great, man. I, you know, that's something else that's really incredible about DW. I mean, all their drums are great, but this is a beautiful Cocobolo kit, too, that they made for me. Just a beautiful set. You can't really see the grain that much, but, man, it's a beautiful kit. But, And I, I like, you know, the um, all of the, you know, maple drums. I use maple drums. But, but for me, this head combination works really great, and I use it with just about anything. I could tune the toms up with the G2s, and they still sound good. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll use a coated, you know, G1 or UV1 or whatever, UV2, you know, whatever, you know, whatever I, you know, depends on the style of music. But I, this is pretty much my sound and, and my setup. Let me switch cameras again. Yeah, and while you do that, I'm just going to throw out there, we have time probably for one more question. So please send oh, those okay. in. If, Can you um, show that? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you show that full screen, uh, Gabe, or whoever's on the switching, just so you can see kind of the head set up? And I, I am using, I use sometimes, this is in my studio here, so I am set up to record. I have a separate system for streaming, so it sounds a little different than it does going into my, uh, if I was recording, but it's still going through my DAW. Um, I am using uh, drum dots. I like the drum dots because they're clear, and you can hardly see them in this picture, but I think you can see I have, you know, some drum dots on here just to, get rid of some of the overtones in the studio, but usually live, I, I use everything pretty much wide open. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's important to experiment around with your sound. I mean, I experimented with heads for a long time and then uh, came up with, uh, with this combination. It, it tends to work really well for me. So, you know, that's a little bit about my setup, heads and, um, you know, sticks. So, yeah. yeah. Any other any other questions? Any anything? Yeah, I think we have one question coming in now. We'll show it up here. Um, and it is how to how to control ghost notes and uh, accents on the snare drum. What sort okay. of exercises do you do to to develop that you know that facility? Because that's obviously such a huge part of of yeah. funk drumming and and you know all kinds of styles really. Sure, sure. A lot of people, I think, a lot of guys, a lot of drummers play the the ghost maybe too much are too little. I mean, it's kind of a either or situation. So you really have to work on those ghost things. A simple pattern like that, just play.
you can practice some little patterns. There's a lot of patterns in the books, again, playing like... Uh, is important too. I have a, an exercise that I like to use a lot with my students. Um, just that gaddish kind of thing. It's a little bit different the way I play it, but it's like this. So it kind of comes back to where we were we were talking before about doubles playing the diddles on the toms. It happens too on the snare drum, you know, just to play the ghost. But you have to; it has to have some phrasing. So again, it's something, there's no secret to it. You just have to practice it and try to just make it sound as, feel as good as it can, you know, but just as easy, easy exercises like the triplet thing I did earlier. You could even come over, you know, bring the right over. That's, that works too. You can do it several different ways, but you know, practice. <laughs> it takes it, practice. It always comes down to the practice. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. and that's another thing too, just quickly, you know, practice, I mentioned it earlier. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of drummers, you know, they practice, they think they have something, but they don't, it's not really part of your vocabulary. And that's the thing, man, you have to, I practiced all this stuff and I still practice it for a long time. And like I said, I don't memorize all this stuff in my books. I mean, I, when I wrote it, I, probably was used it and uh, was more aware of each particular groove. But now it's a part of my playing. When I play doubles or play a shuffle, I know what that's supposed to feel like and can kind of instantly, you know, get into that vibe. It's not easy to do. It takes time and takes it takes practice. You know, I'm not I'm not being facetious about that. And I don't I don't mean to discourage anybody. There's no trick to it. It's just you have to really do it the right way and proper way of practicing. You know, set some goals, you know, have some things. Okay, I want to get my shuffle down. Work on shuffles for like a week, you know, and, you know, improve. You'll improve, you know, the more you do it, the more you okay. use it, too. And don't, don't just play an exercise, but try to use it in a musical setting. That's important. Yeah, man, thank you so much, Rick. This has been really just a total pleasure. And again, I mean... On the practice note, you know, your book, Advanced Funk Studies, is, is one of the best resources out there for, for any drummer, any any level, any style to really help develop some of the facility that you've shown us today. So just want to thank you again for, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with everybody. Oh, thank and you. Um, I, I, I know we didn't get to a lot of the questions, man, and stuff. I don't know if we have some time or... Well, I think you know, yeah, I think we're wrapping for today, but you know, let's. Um, okay. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe we, we can do another one. Maybe we can do another one. You know. Yeah. We can go. In, we can go into the second book. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Like I was going to say, you know, maybe we could end with this. Actually, um, one of my other favorite parts of the book is that you include uh, some really great transcriptions from, you know, just famous, you know, kind of legendary funk tunes. And so, and the first one is is one of the you know drumming's favorite grooves of, of all time. Fifty ways to leave your lover. <laughs> Would you mind playing that for us, and maybe uh, well, we can end well, there? Sure, I can play. I can play my transcription. Actually, I used it before he started doing the hi hat open thing. So.
So he plays it much better than I do, but <laughs> but the idea again, the idea of transcribing it was just so guys could you know get that feel. So play along with the record, you know. It's a little bit slower than that, the the original, but um, you know, that's the the you know the whole idea is to the sticking thing was so important in all of these things. Like there's some that was a time too where all this stuff was playing left hand on the hi hat just quickly. stuff like that you know that's that whole linear kind of idea but yeah I, I don't I don't even know these things by heart you know I have to read them and kind of get them down too you know I mean but that's and that's just one example there's so many in there which is you know again, there's it's some so great cool. licks there's some great licks and I did a thing not long ago actually with all the guys online uh, celebrating and we talked about each one of these licks I had at uh, Steve and I saw uh, that. That was, was so great. cool. Man, yeah. Garibaldi, Garibaldi. I mean, the people that played those. Peter, yeah, exactly. Peter Erskine. Yeah, I mean, every, you know. So it was cool. Yeah, Garibaldi, Jerry Brown, Moon Calhoun, all the uh, Paul Lyme. It was great, man, talking about this stuff. But, you know, some of them are more complex than others. But at that time, nobody was really writing that stuff down. So that's why I wanted to, you know, yeah. I wanted to, to do it. I mean, again, I think it speaks to just what an incredible resource it was that you had those those players, you know, chatting about the book and I mean, they're featured in some of their grooves and, and it's just, it stood the test of time. It's um, really incredible, man. Thank you again. I want to thank everybody that tuned in and, um, you know, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I hope, you know, everybody check it out. Advanced funk studies. Remember on uh, Hudson music, you can, um, you can uh, buy the digital download. Alfred still has, you can purchase hard copies of the book and, um, from Alfred, you can also get the original videos that I did. Also, Drum Channel has my other All About the Groove DVD. And uh, don't forget the, the Rick Latham 717s. Yep. Uh, we got that up there again, 15% off. Um, thank you, Rick, so much again. And congratulations on, on 40 years of this you know amazing resource. Uh, make sure you, you guys check it out, and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. And I want to thank Promark and Dario Evans for... Uh, providing me with the great instruments, man, and great tools to use and delivering my signature sound. Absolutely, man. We're, we're honored to be working with you. So, all right. All right, everyone. Thank thanks again for tuning in. We'll, uh, we'll see you again. next time. All right. I'm going to play a little bit.